I'm John Lagerman with John Deere. Like most Americans, we were heartbroken by the impact of recent hurricanes and wildfires, but amazed at the way people stepped up to help each other. Nowhere is this more evident than in farm communities. That's why John Deere is proud to sponsor Harvest of Thanks. And that's why we donated $1 million to disaster relief last month. Working together, we can repair and rebuild. That's what we do. On behalf of John Deere and our dealers, I just want to say thank you. Hello, I'm Clinton Griffiths. And I'm Tyne Morgan. Thanks for joining us on this brisk fall day. Ooh, it's a cool one today. Well, you know, harvest is not only a time to give thanks. It's also a time to reflect on another year of hard work. And 2017 was a year full of not only blessings, but struggles as well. Yeah, from raging wildfires to unforgiving hurricanes, those in Mother Nature's path will forever remember such a challenging year. But after the fire and after the storms, the heartland triumph. Farmers and ranchers prove that no matter the obstacles of Mother Nature, it's an industry full of so much grit and so much heart. It was a historic year for wildfires. Just three quarter of the way through 2017, USEA announced its wildfire fighting efforts topped two billion dollars, making it the costliest wildfire year ever. The heartbreaking wildfire story launched in March as a historic wildfire burned 1.5 million acres in Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma. And the numbers are startling, with more than 10,000 head of cattle perished from the wildfires and more than 18,000 miles of fence lost due to ferocious flames. While healing is happening, the scars are still there, both on the land and on the lives who fought hard to save their property, livestock, and homes. It's been roughly 10 months since these massive fires scorched the southern plains. The area is rebuilding, life is moving on, but the experiences of that disaster remain raw. Here's Betsy Jimmy. It was just a historic day. The, the fire danger was so high that day. You just tried to save the people, and then after the fire went through and we got some help, then we went back to see what was left. We had never lost a house to a grass fire until that day, and I think we lost 15. And this house we could not protect. Uh, we had to bypass it to go to town. Everything that we see here burned, and it pretty much killed all of our tree rows. Okay, this is some donated hay that came in about probably a month after the fire. Uh, this is just a stack yard. This is one of many that we have scattered around the county for anyone that needs it. Most people stayed, but we, we did have some that left. And here we are pulling up to the firehouse. This was our base through the whole, the whole fire. I just want our, our volunteers to get their day. I am extremely proud. Uh, we got guys from, uh, our youngest is 18, uh, our oldest is maybe in his 70s uh, and they never backed up. We have started rebuilding the herd. I've had some donated. Uh, I've purchased some cows uh, through the auctions. Uh, that's the way I've done mine. We just heard about the fire and everything and uh, we just uh, volunteered to come out here and help these people. The fencing is uh, pretty challenging but we're actually, we're gaining right along on it. We built a mile yesterday and a mile the day before. It's pretty good for just old country bunkins from Tennessee. We have hopes to have it all done by early spring or, or maybe even by the first of the year. We're just proud to be here. I was very proud of America, the way they, they come in and, and helped us out. But not only did they bring hay, they brought hope. And this fire was a, it was a large fire and it was a, uh, a really mean fire. It moved fast and didn't care what it burned, but uh, I think that we should be thankful for being where we're at today. 
it's been a it's been a really good bad experience. When we come back, we'll meet a Texas man who risked his own life to help save livestock and buildings in the path of the fire, but in the end, he was the one who needed help. I'll share his story next. The wind is an ever-present companion among the hard landscapes of the northern panhandle of Texas. As gusts ripple softly across an endless carpet of grass, Cody Graves is still standing in the memories of March. The wind was howling, and I mean, it was just a black wall. Cody, a working cowboy near Lipscomb, Texas, is also a volunteer firefighter. Everybody woke up. The whole the fire department called each other and said, keep your eyes out because this is not a good day. And uh, the humidity was zero and the wind was blowing 45, 50 miles an hour. Good rains brought good grass last spring and plenty of fuel for the fury that would follow. And I was seeing that fire, but it was a ways away from us for a little bit. The wind changed and then that's when our fire department got called out. It was terrible. There was tornadoes in that uh, fire. Even visible from passenger planes above, the fire now racing across the prairie. And I said, there is no way we can do anything about this. We could have a hundred trucks that couldn't stop this. They fought anyway, doing all they could, saving houses, cutting fences, spring livestock, all while nearly losing their own fire station in the process. It's a master lock that was on that storage building outside. People that's been fighting fire longer than I have were scared and didn't know what to do. The hours and the acres burned on. That fire started Monday and it was Tuesday morning about 3 o'clock in the morning and we got called to another fire. In the smoke and the tiredness, Cody's fire truck slipped off an embankment. It kind of jarred me a little bit and uh, it was hurting pretty bad, and, uh, but we couldn't stop. 15 hours later, those trucks were parked, but Cody's next steps would be his hardest. It was about a week after the fire. I was just couldn't walk very well, and it was just wasn't sleeping, and so I figured I'd just go get it checked out, and here we are. <laughs> his diagnosis, severe damage to his spine. A problem that's not new, as a young man, an accident left him in a similar situation. Doctors said he'd likely never walk again. Will he prove them wrong? This time seems different. His back is in tangles. This cowboy's doing more sitting than roping. Walking is hard. Working and riding, impossible. I'm trying to find peace. You know, it's kind of hard when you can't go out and play with the kids a little bit. And uh, the boys are taking it kind of rough. He passes the time with his hands, reflecting on the fires still burning through his thoughts, knowing he's the lucky one. Friends of mine got killed in McLean, and I knew the, the kid that got killed here outside of Lipscomb. And it's a, it was a tragic deal. I mean, there's, when you hear of a fire taking lives, you wish you could have done more and helped more. And yet, help has lifted his spirits. I mean, it was, it was very humbling. And I mean, I had grown men crying and people that, you know, usually helped other people didn't know how to take the help, but it humbled them in a way. You know, you, it makes you proud to live in this country after seeing all the people that come together. A community helping to restore lives, supporting each other, rebuilding the future, like the rains that soaked these blackened fields, that spirit helps new life spring forth, rooted and resilient. Just five months later, Texas was hit again. This time with water. We have the story of perseverance and hope next. Welcome back. Hurricane Harvey was relentless, 
More than 50 inches of rain fell near Houston. In total, 27 trillion gallons of water dumped on the land. With a bumper cotton crop setting in the field, as the catastrophe unfolded, it washed away hopes of a bountiful year, but it didn't drown out ag's spirit of survival. You got a, a street or two off of the main road, and it just looked like a war zone. We've had, you know, I guess storms and hurricanes, and, but nothing's ever been like this that I can remember. This was no little storm. You stop and you look at it, it is definitely historic. Those individuals that thought that they were out of harm's way ended up having to evacuate themselves out of their homes, get their families to safety, and then they had to deal with their livestock. That, that is the lifeblood of this community is agriculture. This is kind of the, I think the depth of what it got in the house, you know, all the way up here to this log. You know, I'm sure that one's wet some too. Like I've always told young ones, if you make money, save it. The bad one's coming. The yields were above normal. What we picked, some was over three, and some two and three quarters. And I've had yields at that level, but not over basically every acre that's grown here. That was the big difference. Talk to the farmers, they say this was the crop of, of a decade for them. That's really the crop that folks are going to make a profit on this year, uh, right up until this happened. It's always, always good to make a good crop. And hey, all, the, all the cotton in the county was you know, really good, exceptional. It was, it was going to be a, a personal record, I know. Now it's just going to be what it is. I've got some fields that we didn't get to. They appear to be picked right now after this. I've got some modules totally destroyed in the field. You hear the roar, you kind of walk outside and you look up and those trees aren't leaning one way or the other. They're literally swirling at the top, almost like what would be in a tornado. And if you've seen cattle, as I know you have, when they get into those kind of winds, they kind of turn and face it. It's a very, very resilient species and breed. We have a lot of stranded cattle. A lot of these cattle that swam for miles, some of them, to find high ground and they can't move any further. So we've got to get some feed and hay to them, to those areas. We have a tremendous group of, uh, of dedicated volunteers that have come in from across Texas and some of them across the United States. It's a Texas way. You know, you're friendly, you help people, you, you do what you can for anybody, no matter if they're your friend, your neighbor, a stranger, or uh, anything else. The whole family's safe. And we're all good. We're, this is it's a mess. But we're going to fix it. Our thanks to Texas Farm Bureau for that piece. Well, Hurricane Harvey definitely left its mark with $200 million of damages just to crops and livestock in the state. And yet Mother Nature wasn't done. Just two weeks later, another massive hurricane hit Florida. We head there next. It's an emotional holiday season for citrus growers in Southwest Florida. In September, Hurricane Irma wiped out months of farmers' efforts in a matter of hours. A crushing scene in the small town of LaBelle. Rows of citrus trees bent over from hurricane-forced winds, branches snapped, and fruit still on the ground. I had a beautiful crop. My buyers were all excited. Everybody's excited. The fruit was beautiful, clean, nice and then the storm came. Martin Mason started in the citrus business shortly after retiring. That was 2011. Six years later, his first crop of 40 acres in ruins. I hate to admit this, but during the storm, I got on my little gator and drove out and I could see the trees laying over and I, I knew what it was like. It was just devastating. So we've lost uh, probably three to 4,000 boxes, I think. It's very saddening in the morning to come out and look at it. Just down the road, a similar story. About nine o'clock when it did uh, subside, uh, I went out and, and certainly you could uh, really tell. Even in the dark, uh, right shortly after it, uh, we, I could tell it wasn't gonna be good the next morning. From probably uh, a low of 60% uh, on some of my Valencia late season oranges to probably 80% uh, uh, on some uh, early season oranges that were uh, more mature, bigger. 
A devastating situation for lifetime farmer Wayne Simmons, who says they had finally turned a corner after a decade of battling citrus greening. They thought we did have a better crop that we would maybe uh, start plateauing and maybe increasing. So uh, uh, very optimistic in the industry, but after this, it's, uh, it's really been tough. And the tough times aren't over. We had 90 to 95 percent of our expenses in this crop and uh, then to see all our income hit the ground from the storm. So we're basically going to have to carry these grows probably for at least another 18 months at the minimum um, with no income to speak of. Unfortunately, the crop insurance uh, is not geared to Florida, uh, to citrus. It's more geared to the Midwest, to uh, corn, soybeans, and cotton, and those uh, row crop varieties. So, uh, you know, we're probably only going to get uh, at no more than 25 cents on the dollar. After all this, the huge financial loss, the stress, the recovery work, the resilience keeps them moving forward and into harvest. So I'm a farmer, I'm not gonna run away from it. Steadfast and grateful in their resolve. I'm, I'm thankful uh, for my uh, family, uh, for, for uh, being a part of uh, uh, God's steward and uh, what he's given me and uh, uh, you know it's uh, it's easy to get uh, emotional about it but uh, oh I've got a great number of things to be thankful for. With so much heartache in the heartland we have thoughts on perseverance. John Phipps joins us next. One of my earliest and most cherished memories of my grandmother was standing beside her in her kitchen one winter afternoon as she made pies. A dear friend of hers had died unexpectedly and she was making pies to take to the family. Her pies were legendary and not just to me, her number one fan. What struck this engineer to be most strongly was how she could do it seemingly automatically. No recipes or measuring or wasted motion. On this occasion though, I looked up to see tears of grief slide down her flower covered cheek as she worked. I was too young to fully understand her loss, of course. Her friend was just another old lady in the church, which I now realize meant someone in her 50s. Even at that age, it hurt to see my grandmother so sad. I asked her how she could work when she felt so bad. I recall her reply, Johnny, it is when you hurt that working to help others is the best thing you can do. Besides, I've never had anybody say no to a pie. Hearts have been broken by fire and water this year, from Puerto Rico to Montana, from Houston to Santa Rosa, too many Americans have faced painful losses firsthand or, like my grandmother, through the bonds of friendship, neighborhood, or kin. Modern psychology has often suggested grief counseling and other talking cures to help victims adjust and move past despair. As useful as such efforts may be, many experts are adding something like pie making, action and movement to start the emotional recovery process. In a way, farmers who loaded up hay for hungry cattle and desperate farmers were making pies of their own. In the process, consolation was poured out on survivor and donor alike. There will be a time ahead to share and process those painful memories, and we should always be ready to listen and encourage. But I hope our instincts become shaped by the pattern of not just asking what we can do when disaster strikes, but spontaneously doing what we can do. Make a pie of some sort and then give it away. Well said, John. You know, in a time of so much divisiveness and uncertainty, it's an honor to work in this industry and with people who care. Yeah, they care for their neighbors, their families, their land, and their futures. We've stood witness to this time and time again. So this holiday season, as you give thanks for the blessings in your own lives, feel good knowing you stepped up, you reached out, and you gave to others in need. There's no scorecard, there's no tally, no golden stickers, but we noticed, and we're proud to stand with you in trials and in triumphs. May your awards be evident 
and the blessings before you and as an industry that exemplifies both thanks and giving. Well said. God bless and have a great Thanksgiving holiday with your families, everyone.